So we've now reached chapter 36, which now divides itself into World War II and also going into the Cold War. So some of the information leading up to World War II, which we'll rehash a very little bit here, um, has been talked about in chapters 34 and 35 in terms of the, you know, the buildup to the war uh, from the German and Italian perspectives in chapter 34 and then chapter 35 with the buildup of Japan and also their first interactions in Manchuria versus China. So we'll kind of split that. And so the next few videos are going to be divided into focusing on uh, World War II. So that's kind of what all of uh, the first one or two videos will be focused on, as well as, um, you know, this particular uh, section of notes. Then there'll be a whole section for the Cold War, probably one or two videos related to that. And then another uh, tying up within uh, the Holocaust and atrocities uh, against civilians during the war as well. So for us, the big takeaway for AP World, though, in terms of looking at World War II are sort of, you know, the causes, um, the reactions, obviously, in terms of, you know, government reactions, but also the impacts on civilian populations and the long-term impacts that has in terms of, again, colonialization, globalization, uh, and then things building into the Cold War. So, again, this is going to be a very quick rehash of just coming some of the main events and some of the main buildups into the war, and then tie it back in a little bit to uh, the end of the war. So, kind of revisiting from Chapter 35, so in the midst of, um, you know, the Great Depression, Japan, uh, its military, you know, going back into more imperialist policies that it's sort of drawn back a little bit from, uh, you know, following World War I, uh, end up, you know, already having Korea in 1910. Uh, Taiwan, the island, half the island of Sakhalin down here. Um, they actually in the 1930s also kind of have a quick skirmish against, um, you know, the Russians out here, which actually prevents China from going further in there and actually um, not going to war with the Soviet Union. Um, end up invading and taking Manchuria over an incident regarding the railroads, which heavily implied through historical sources that the J Japanese were in fact uh, behind that. So um, they use that as a pretext with the Japanese military to take on uh, Manchuria and kind of claim it as its own little puppet state, its own little province or colony. Um, and, you know, the League of Nations condemns it, but other than, you know, some embargoes, do not force Japan out. And uh, under more pressure, Japan leaves, um, you know, the League of Nations during, I don't remember if it's during this incident or later on in the 1930s when they go for their full-on invasion of China itself. So prior to, or expansions prior to uh, World or Pearl Harbor in December 7th, 1941, you see a lot of the most major cities and coastal areas uh, that are also happen to be the most po heavily populated and industrial centers within China. So Shanghai, um, or, you know, uh, Beijing over here, Port Arthur, um, Canton, and then, you know, uh, Shantung, and a few other long, you know, uh, very heavily populated, dense, and, you know, uh, cities and industrial cities are under Japanese hands, so much so um, that we see kind of, uh, we'll talk about the rape of Nanking here in a sec, um, but have fallen under Japanese control. And again, these are the pockets of control and areas that were held by the nationalist or the Chinese nationalist army laying by uh, Chiang, Chiang Kai-shek, as we know him in English. And so that hurts the ability of Chiang Kai-shek to try and unify China under a nationalist standpoint, while they're still obviously persecuting and going after the communist groups. Uh, led by Mao Zedong. And that will again lead to essentially the survival of the Chinese Communist Party and to gain more rural background while the nationalists do a lot of the fighting against the uh, Japanese in the early offings to help solidify communist power is kind of the um, unintended consequence of the Japanese invasion, oddly enough. So, and then obviously taking uh, French Indochina or what we know today to be kind of Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia in 1940. All right. And so while the world condemns Japanese actions, what we end up seeing is, again, other than embargoes, no one's really stopping them. Okay, they're facing, yeah, obviously a very large Chinese army, but they're having a decent amount of success taking, again, a lot of the inland or coastal areas um, from them. So one of the things for what leads up to the invasion of the United States, or not the United not even invasion, uh, but for the attack on Pearl Harbor and then the subsequent land grab that the Japanese are going to make throughout much of Southeast Asia and into the Pacific and Oceania happens to be related to the fact that they do not have raw material. So we'll come back to um, these two slides here in a sec. So the Japanese, as we previously stated in the last chapter, they want less dependence on the West. They want to prove themselves economically and imperially to be on par with the West, but also to not be connected to their globalization with the Great Depression that had obviously weakened Japan, and then they reinvested into their military, into their economy, uh, by focusing on more of their own dependence in this part of the world. All right. So, um, and in some cases, when they start invading some of these former um, European colonies, they start to say themselves or look at themselves as liberators 
uh, even though a lot of the times their rule is actually just as harsh, if not worse, uh, than the Europeans had been. All right. So when the war, they, when they decided to go to war with the United States, the U.S. had imposed an oil embargo on Japan. And oil was obviously needed for planes, for their tanks, for their ships, in order for them to control uh, the parts that they had, but also to obviously make uh, forward expansion into the rest of the region. And so when the U.S. cuts them off, they figure, well, we can keep fighting until we run out of oil. We can pull back in China and other places like the U.S. wants us to, and then we can get all the oil and trade we want. Or we can attack the United States, weaken their navy, surprise the rest of the region, and kind of go for broke, hold on to territory until they have to give in, and, you know, again, be on equal footing, and then we'll be the dominant power in Asia is kind of, uh, you know, the goal here. So connecting to that, if you look at this map here, I um, mean, look at the important minerals that, you know, Japan has, um, for the most part is a little bit of gold, silver, and then, you know, coal, all right, which while important does not run uh, your tanks, doesn't run your planes, doesn't run your ships. But down here, in order to um, get less dependence on um, U.S. oil, you have Indonesia and Malaysia, which are heavily, heavy located within there and also have iron ore stores, more natural gas stores. Things that Japan definitely needs to keep its economy going because Japan has always been a good producer of things, even though they don't have enough raw materials to actually make most of them on their own. So again, these are the reasons for why they target the areas that they do. So in their first actions in 1937 and 1938, when they invade Shanghai and then also into Nanking or Nanjing, um, which at that point was the Republican or the Republic of China's capital, okay, um, it leads to just a lot of prolonged street fighting and devastation. Uh, that unfortunately uh, lays over what we're going to see, unfortunately, with more civilian casualties and intended civilian casualties um, through acts of brutal terror and um, really just acts against humanity. Um, and there's a reason why they call it the rape of, you know, Nanking or Nanjing because of the fact that um, people who surrendered, um, in many cases, the soldiers who surrendered were killed, um, others forced into labor, and then a lot of women were raped repeatedly and then murdered afterward. Um Again, just kind of a preview to what will be going on throughout World War II to civilian populations. Well, one thing to consider, why did the Japanese treat their captives or just people that they had conquered in this way? Because it will also get extended into treatment of American prisoners, but we'll also see this with how the um, Germans react to people that they capture or surrender or attempt to surrender, and also especially with the Soviet Union too. So within Japanese culture, that view of surrendering was, you know, going back to a lot of things in tradition that, you know, think about this with the samurai, it, surrendering is to be cowardice, all right? So you deserve to be punished or treated poorly for surrendering rather than dying with honor, all right? And so we get this quote here from Max, Sir Max Hastings, a uh, British historian, okay, on World War II. The weak deserved to be treated with contempt. Only strength was to be valued. Only strength, or sorry, only strength was valued. Only strength was admired. In some ways, this was a cult not very dissimilar from that of the SS, which was, you know, a lot of fanatical, uh, you know, Nazi followers um, who really believed the Nazi doctrine as opposed to a regular German person. So the belief that people who were weak enough to surrender, and especially who had been weak enough to surrender without even putting up much of a fight, deserved to die and deserved to be treated as animals as slaves, or sorry, animal as animals and slaves. So, again, and you're taking a kind of a view of a racial lens here, of prejudice lens, that these people are less than human, and to even surrender is even making it the situation worse, and thus they deserve the punishment that they're getting. Um, and this, again, takes on that mentality that helps to explain a lot of the behaviors that are taken by, um, you know, Nazis who think of themselves to be a superior Aryan race, but also the Japanese for their perspectives and treatment of the Chinese, and then also the prisoners that they take throughout the war. All right, so you might be thinking about some connections there to social Darwinism, too. So um, we'll come back to Japan. Oh, sorry. Um, actually, yeah. So then when they actually do, in fact, uh, attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941, here's the map where that was the day before. And then the furthest extent we see on this map here in the bottom right at their high point halfway through 1942. So through about six to eight months, um, Japan really does actually expand into the Philippines, into Papua New Guinea, um, the Solomon Islands out here, grabbing all of these um, islands and island chains. Indonesia pretty much falls because the Dutch have been conquered by the by the Germans at this point. Same thing with the French, um, you know, and then Siam and, and uh, Burma slash Myanmar either, you know, completely surrender or um, become to become like essentially non-aligned, non-aligned allied states to 
um, the Japanese. So that land grab really does take place as they're trying to hold on to this territory before the Allies can react. So if they attack Pearl Harbor on December 7th, they pretty much attack Singapore, Malaysia, um, the Philippines, and a lot of other locations on December 8th. Because this had been planned long in advance to really grab as much territory as possible and to impose their will and entrench themselves before the Allies, particularly the United States, can react. <clears throat> so that's kind of the background, the build-up to the things here within, um, you know, uh, Japan. So switching over very quickly here, kind of towards the last third here in the video for uh, Germany, is the idea of appeasement. And so when we talk about appeasement, it's giving into demands that, or giving into an enemy's demands in order to maintain order and peace. So when t people talk about, well, why did you know Germany? Why were they allowed to rearm? Why were they allowed to take so much territory before the Allies stepped in, being you know Britain and France? And that comes back to you know we're not even 20 years, or just about 20 years past World War One. All right, so people are still reeling financially from that. They're reeling from the losses and the attrition of, you know, World War I and how many people, again, tying back into, you know, the feeling that, you know, World War I didn't really have a point. There was a lot of senseless slaughter. And so this is kind of, again, an imperialist war. What's the point of, you know, doing this? Others who, again, you know, this is also during a lot of economic hardship because of, because of the Great Depression. You have social and political strife. So you have communist uprisings as well. So a lot of internal problems within these countries also. So why would they want to focus on, you know, trying to stop Germany when they have problems of their own? So in many cases, other people would say, you know, well, you know, we did treat them pretty harshly with that Treaty of Versailles. You know, maybe that's okay to let them act out a little bit. He's not going to do too much. So um, that's kind of the big thing. So um, when Hitler rearms the German military, nobody, they kind of like, yeah, well, you know, okay, fine. They start putting uh, soldiers back in the Rhineland over here. Okay, that's a little more auspicious, but, you know, that is their own territory. All right. Um, then when they unite with Austria, which they were forbidden to do under the Treaty of Versailles, okay, now things are getting a little shady. Then he starts to demand this area known as the Sudetenland, which is kind of, again, a carving out of this little sliver that I'm kind of going over with the mouse here in Czechoslovakia that has continued, like, the part of Bohemia, um, where a lot of German people, more German than Czech people, live, or at least that's what Hitler claimed. So this is the last thing I want. Last thing, I don't want anything else. Okay, German people belong to Germany and they should all be united. And rather than go to war over it, okay, Neville Chamberlain of uh, Great Britain, who was the prime minister at the time, and then um, the French president meet with Hitler and Mussolini in Munich and sign what's known as the Munich Pact um, that says we will give him the Sudetenland in order to, in, in order to keep and maintain peace. Because this is the last thing Hitler promises that he's going to take. And so... They're kind of banking that, you know, he, he will be really done at this point. Unfortunately for them, later on, about six, within the next six months, Hitler then uh, takes the rest of Czechoslovakia um, without a single shot. And it's one thing to also consider that um, Czech, the Czechs were not invited, the Czechoslovakian people, the Czechs and the Slovaks were not invited to the peace conference. So then Hitler demands this part of Poland, known as the Polish Corridor, that would unite um, then with the Eastern Prussian portion of Germany and the Poles say no, British and French say no. And they say, okay, at this point, you know, we've learned our lesson that Hitler is going to do whatever he wants unless we oppose him. And so they're hoping that this will be again, another deterrent. Hitler doesn't care because he signed a non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union that we'll talk about in the next video. He invades Poland on September 1st, 1939, which officially starts the war because now you have more than two nations fighting. Now it is a cohesion of nations of alliances now fighting each other. All right. So after he takes Poland in the span of a month, splitting it with the uh, Soviet Union, um, using blitzkrieg warfare, which again, we're not really diving into a whole lot here. Um, we'll talk about that more in the next video. They're able to grab pretty much all of Western Europe and also Denmark and Norway. And France will fall by, you know, middle of, you know, June 1940. Um, what's left of many of the Allied armies, about a couple hundred thousand troops are uh, saved at Dunkirk. Um, but now Great Britain will stand alone. So that's going to be kind of where we're going to pick up with the second video, um, talking about kind of that little bit more about Blitzkrieg and lightning warfare and how Hitler is so successful, Battle of Britain, and then turning the tide once he invades Russia. So that's where we're going to wrap up here with this first one, and we're going to start off for the second video.